Uh, welcome everyone to the Northern Illinois University Art Museum's virtual event this afternoon, Artwork for Healing and Focusing, an appreciative look at the art of Matthias Grunwald and Louis Schwartzberg by Museum Director Joe Burke. I'm Stuart Hen, the museum's education coordinator, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon. A few notes about this presentation. This Zoom event is being recorded so you can rewatch or invite others who are not able to join us live today. Once closed captioned and formatted for web viewing, you can stream a recording of this presentation by visiting niu.edu forward slash art museum forward slash events. I'll post all URLs in the meeting chat. To minimize interruptions, everyone has been muted except our presenter. Feel free to ask questions in the chat and I'll help moderate those at the end of the presentation time allowing. Programs of the NIU Art Museum are sponsored in part by the Illinois Arts Council Agency through federal funds provided by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Friends of the NIU Art Museum, the College of Visual and Performing Arts season presenting sponsor Shaw Media, and the NIU Arts and Culture Fee. This exhibition and programming are part of the College of Visual and Performing Arts program, Rejuvenation, an Artistic Journey from Trauma to Recovery, Art Heals. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce and turn our screen over to Joe Burke. Thank you, Stuart. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate that. Maybe we'll have a few more join us. Maybe not. We'll see. I'll try to watch my time on this. I'm not quite sure how long it'll take. And at one point, just warning you, fair game, I will probably ask you to unmute and contribute. So depending on how long that part takes, we'll see how long this program is. So I'm supposed to share my screen, All right? Do I remember how to do that? Yes, hold on. All right. Grab this. And And I get this to work, Stuart, from beginning. Maybe that'll work. Yay. Okay. So you can change your viewing of the screen and just get really big on this image if you want. And I can just blather on. Um, or you can peek at everybody. So I changed the title a little bit. It's still focusing. That's where I lost my, my focus. <laughs> Studies on Visual Artwork for Healing and Well-Being. See how this works. So, um, this is the recent New Yorker ad that for years had the same one. They finally changed it and I thought, oh, this is lovely. You know, here's this woman appreciating this Jackson Pollock-like painting with the butterfly. And, coming to life out of that artwork. And it's as if she's inhaling this painting. It's just like to become so engrossed in looking at art and what it can do for you. So if you've been to the art museum lately, um, you'll come and see all sorts of COVID warnings on the door. You know. And we also put up a lot of warnings, like if there's something violent, something of a political nature that maybe you you just are warned, um, or if it's sexual, whatever, we tend to warn people. For this show, I put a warning. Um, art may make you smile, laugh, cry, dream, feel better, think more clearly, do more good. There's also a little bit of nudity and some swearing, but it's not too offensive. So that's a lot of claim to make about art. Um, hopefully the show does that, at least in parts. I think there's little bits that do all of that. Um, just so you know, the show is now online and you can look at it at our Flickr site. Um, we also usually put in a bulletin board where people can participate and add jokes or articles or um, handouts. And so we do have a number of handouts there from the University Office of Counseling. But to get into the studies on art, um, this is actually some COVID, somebody bored with their gerbils and lots of time on their hands. So they made this lovely little gallery 
but it looks like it's a new science experiment. Um, most of the sources I looked at there are from these two sites and just looking at a couple of different studies. Um, many of them have taken place in um, the United Kingdom and where they know the value of a good cup of tea. So some of these studies, I hope you can see this screen better than I am, because of course my screen is partly being blocked here. But this is an analysis of 10 years of articles on art interventions in hospitals that suggest um, that arts, the perception is that it does impact their patients' stress levels, mood, pain levels, and sleep. And that, but again, it's perception um, and belief. Um, common sense tells us this would happen and that that would all be good. Psychological and sociological tests tend to measure perception. What we want to see is that drop in cortisol level and an elevation in dopamine. Less pain medication needed, lower blood pressure, more solid periods of restful recuperative sleep, earlier release dates. And of course, hospitals see this as less expense, right? Um, so there is an aspect to being mindful in that hopefully is what helps with some of these. Um, the studies in general, when they looked at them, showed that the staff at the hospital believed, and that's important. Um, it also helped their rapport, not only with the patients, but with each other. Um, and the majority of staff reported these positive outcomes from having this in particular was art activities in the healthcare settings, um, decreasing stress, improving mood, improving their job performance, reducing burnout, really key and critical, um, improving patient staff relationships, it gives them something to talk about, um, improving the working environment, nothing less austere than those horrible sanitary walls, um, and in general, improving their well being. Um, one of the studies, and this was again in England, this is in Manchester, I think, um, the impact of arts activities on the nursing staff when they got to work together doing something. And this was a study, um, pretty good number of participants, 115 um, in the hospital, getting 56 of them to work on this for several weeks, once a week for 10 weeks, and they did silk painting activities. Now, silk painting activities are gonna be a kind of thing where you could just splash in the color. You know, it's pretty easy kind of thing where you don't have to feel intimidated about your drawing ability. You don't have to worry about, oh, I don't have that kind of background, but I can play with these colors. You know, I might be able to figure out pattern or whatever that really feels nice and I can make something functional, nothing much better than that. Um, so their data, and they used um, a couple different studies, the soci they did their socio-demographic questions, and then they used these couple different studies, and we're just going to peek at those studies, because I found that to go, well, what is that? What, what are you asking when you ask that? The Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, short form, the reader stress scale, the multidimensional fatigue inventory, and they did these things before and after activities. And having that timing of these tests is what often helps to really understand if something is really having an impact and how long the impact lasts. Their data is then analyzed. And I, I don't come at you with samples of some of this because it starts to just look like really complex math equations. Um, at one point, I remember saying to my mom, maybe I'd like to be a sociologist. And she said, you'll have to take statistics. <laughs> so like, okay, I won't do that. Not knowing what that was, I probably would have liked it anyway. So all these things down at the bottom, various things to see how scientific it is. 
I hope you can read some of this. This is um, the, the well-being test. I'm going to go back a second because what's the name of that title? Oh, no. The Warwick Edinburgh Mental Well-Being Scale. All right, it's cut off at the top, at least for me, maybe not for you. Um, and they usually, you know, how often do you have these feelings and thoughts? This one just asking for the two weeks. If you've been feeling optimistic about the future, feeling useful, feeling relaxed, interested in other people, energy to spare, dealing with problems well, thinking clearly, feeling good about myself, feeling close to other people, feeling confident, been able to make up my mind about things, feeling loved, interested in new things, and feeling cheerful. So asking these nurses, how are they doing? It'd be interesting to see. Nobody probably had time for any such thing during COVID, but um, eventually maybe we'll get back to some of these. But just to see this well-being test, what, what really, where are you at? Rarely, some of the time, often, all the time, none of the time. Um, this one is a stress test. And looking at, and I'm going to zoom in close on the screen. Yes, that is true to know that's not true and finding that scale in between, which I like because whenever I would have to grade anything, I was always like, oh, it's somewhere over here, it's over here. I could never just pick something in the middle. So is that true? No, it's not true. I feel fit. Physically, I feel only able to do a little. I feel very active. I feel like doing all sorts of nice things. I feel tired. I think I do a lot in a day. When I am doing something, I can keep my thoughts on it. Physically, I can take on a lot. I dread having to do things. I think I do very little in a day. I can concentrate well. I am restful. It takes a lot of effort to concentrate on things. Physically, I feel I'm in a bad condition. I have a lot of plans. I tire easily. I get a little done. I don't feel like doing anything. My thoughts easily wander. Physically, I feel I'm in excellent condition. So rating that, and again, they rated these like right after working on some of their silk painting and then later, you know, and they did this for many weeks. So that was a nice one where they would periodically work through these and get to see. But these sort of tests are used in a lot of these different studies. Um, and then this last one, which is um, the MFI. I'm going back again with my thing. What's the name of that test? Sorry. The multidimensional fatigue inventory. Never to very often. In the last month. How often have you been upset because of something that happened unexpectedly? In the last month. How often have you felt that you were unable to control the important things in your life? In the last month, how often have you felt nervous and stressed? How often have you felt confident about your ability to handle your personal problems? How often have you felt that things were going your way? How often have you found that you could not cope with all the things you had to do? How often have you been able to control irritations in your life? How often have you felt that you were on top of things? In the last month, how often have you been angered because of things that were outside of your control? How often have you felt difficulties were piling up so high you could not overcome them? Now, I remember when I was telling some of our members that, oh, we're going to do a show on well being. You know, someone said, what's well being? Because that's not really a word that we used a lot before. And, you know, when we did the show, I sort of thought it's about balance, you know, it's about finding, you know, some rhythms in your life that are healthy. You know, and control, being able to control some stuff. Um, so in that nursing test, you can see some of the stats, um, but mostly, again, the 
positive impact on general health and mental well being, reducing stress and fatigue, awaking creativity, and increasing a sense of community at work. Um, some of these folks even said they plan to continue doing arts activities in the future and shows that could be a good activity. That's always sort of the conclusion. This research suggests that art as a workplace intervention can be used to promote either patient or staff well-being. So that made me think about, well, that's good. We all know, at least artists know, yeah, making art helps. That's good. You know, whether it's we're expressing ourselves or we're putting an image to something that we can't put words to, it, it's this process. So um, made me wonder though, okay, well, what about the artwork? What about just looking at art? What, does that do you any good? Um, so then looking in hospitals and here one artist who's uh, artist in residence um, and then just finished painting this children's ward. Um, and this other who's put all these crystals for healing in the, over the bed. Um, and of course, you know, the families at the hospital having to, you know, get to play. And here's a nice interactive sort of piece because he's always got his little Superman there with him. Um, but looking at patient perceptions of arts and healthcare, there's really a paucity of qualitative studies. Um, there's usually a variety of methods used and there seems to be a variability of methodological rigor. Um, some of the studies do, it's this phenomenology of just describing, you know, what is this experience and then having um, those, some of those sort of reviews of some of the things we just looked at. Um, the mixed methods approach seems to be pretty frequent. Um, and then there's usually this interview. Um, one of the problems was, and again, this is looking at lots of studies, and they basically said there just wasn't a lot on just receptive engagement with the arts and aesthetics was still really lacking. And so we're seeing this stuff happening more and more. Um, we trust it's going to work. We all feel good about it. There's whole businesses now for, for healthcare, paintings in hospitals, aesthetics incorporated. Um, there's foundations, you know, the White Feather Foundation, which assists both artists and hospitals in putting together, you know, their works and getting things there. It's actually run by Julian Lennon. Um, you know, you have hospitals like the Mayo Clinic where they have masterpieces out. How fabulous. You know, they've got Chihuly, they got your Warhol, we got your, you know, Calder. Um, all this stuff there makes it nice for the nurses to be around, I would say, and the doctors. Nice for the families when they go to visit. I don't know how many of the patients get to see some of this stuff, depending on how long you're there and at what point you're mobile and getting to wander around. Hopefully you get to interact with someone while there and looking at these things. You also have curators being hired by hospitals. Um, and you have other programs and now lots of universities picking up on this health program and creating these new things. University of Florida is just starting a new uh, health and the arts in their art, art department. Um, and, you know, NIU is involved with stuff at Northwestern Tisch Hospital, getting things decorated. I think it matters, like, well, what kind of things you putting in there? <laughs> you know, um, studies typically show that the preference is for nature images, the more realistic, so that someone can imagine themselves being able to be in the artwork and not in the hospital. And that abstraction tends to cause more stress. 
Um, it's like neurobiophilia, nature is what heals us. Depending on the location of the hospital, the best thing would be a window. Not a brick wall that you're looking out on though. You wanna look out on nature. Um, I, I, when I'm reading this, I'm just like, oh yeah, well, some of you guys may remember Komar and Melamed and America's Most Wanted Painting. These were conceptual artists um, who had done a whole series of the most wanted and the least wanted um, painting, and they did it for all different countries and cultures, and it pretty much was the same worldwide, except, of course, America's painting, Most Wanted, when we say, well, are you going to have a famous person in the picture? Do you like pictures with portraits? Well, we, at that time, 94, wanted George Washington. I hate to think what people might want now. Um, so their questions, Comar and Melamed, they hired a marketing firm in 1993 to interview over a thousand typical Americans about this painting taste as they did in other countries. So the thing is, these hospital studies, they're like, oh, we got 54 people. Oh, we had 23 people. I'm like, come on, thousand people. Let's get some more data. So their question, what's your favorite color? Do you prefer paintings with sharp angles or soft curves? Do you like smooth canvases or thick brush strokes? Would you rather look at a painting with figures that are nude or fully clothed? Should the people in the painting be at leisure or working? They then produced a sample image meeting, oh, excuse me, should they be indoors or outdoors? And if the latter, what kind of landscape? And then they present, pre prepared these images. Um, and then of course, they also asked about scale and in relatable terms, do you like your artwork the size of a refrigerator? the size of a dishwasher or the size of a toaster. <laughs> Americans like dishwasher size paintings that look like this. A lot of blue, a lot of green, landscape, mountains, little water, nature, got those nice animals. Um, we can be there, we wanna be closed and we can be relaxing. We don't really wanna look at work. And if there's going to have to be someone famous, that 94 was George Washington. Um, their painting that what Americans didn't like, of course, was abstract, thick paint, hard edged, warm tones, muddy, and toaster size. <laughs> so it just struck me as here, Komar and Melamed, these conceptual artists who years ago did this project, um, managed to get pretty much on target with what hospitals are now figuring out, like, oh, yeah, that's what people like. Um, like blue and green, cool and soothing. Um, there's a, another interesting study that was done in England, um, the Helen Hamlin Center for Design at the Royal College of Art. And they have a special focus on art and design in relation to autism in collaboration with this organization called Paintings in Hospitals. And they did a six month period, uh, autumn to spring, 2013, 14, pretty much in agreement with Comar and Melamed study. Um, folks with, on the autism spectrum that they worked with, and they did a lot with social media, um, talking with different groups. So that was a, a great way. But they sent them these images, which were like, okay, well, you picked the image that you're giving me. I still think there needs to be some context for this. And maybe I wouldn't have agreed with just which picture you picked. Um, and again, though, you see abstraction is like, you don't really like that. <laughs> um, people, little nerve wracking. And mostly it was like, don't have the people staring out at me. You know, that's too confrontational, don't really like that. Um, there were some comments about a person who is looking down and they're like fists, and I don't know if you can see me or not, but are they grimacing or are they smiling? Are they laughing? What is it? And I don't know how to read that. 
And so that was a little, you know, caused some anxiety. Um, but it seems like, yeah, it still fits the same pattern again, Tomar and Melamed study. So the thing is that medical training has a lot to do with observation. And so studies have been being done with medical students um, having sessions in art museums, taking tours, using visual thinking strategies to explore artwork and to learn to slow down and to better focus and to learn to trust their observations and to learn to listen. And one particularly, I thought, a good study that I came across was a dermatology residence at Stanford. And they found their improved observational skills after their museum visits with the guided tour, um, both with representative art and non-representative art help their communication skills. And again, they did immediately post-intervention and three months post-intervention asking them, okay, what changes do you plan to make with your, what they call their um, handoff? <laughs> or have you implemented any changes? Will you look for it? what will you look for in a patient to improve communication? And from your experience in clinic today, can you think of an example um, of what you used in observation to improve communication with your patient? And they actually had some pretty good things. And having been to a dermatologist who was there with his intern, I can say, yeah, I can see where this could help. You want them to <laughs> be able to explore, to view, to explain to you what they're looking at. Can you explain, like, why should I worry about that particular mole, or is that really not bad? That's not a bad one. Really look at that. You know, now watch when it changes. You know, um, making sure that the patient understands, reading their body language, reading um, as well as what they say, or just the glazed look in their eye. Um, asking the patient to describe what they see, you know? Um, so it, many of the residents in this study, they'd come back with some really strong responses and they felt that they had learned a bit. So I, this is a artist who has been working on things that I hope will help some doctors. She's been looking at pain. Um, she's an artist who's in Iowa. She's had chronic, you know, like migraines since she was a kid. And then they um, it really compounded when she got to by about 20. And um, so she's now 28, 28, at one point making a series of busts that, you know, everything from, you know, shooting him with a glass shotgun you know, putting the um, nails in them, putting um, uh, oh, a, a railroad spike through the eye and all that kind of thing. And then more recently doing this thing where she's working with a henna artist and a photographer and mapping out how the pain flows in her body. And so she's fully nude in some of her other shots, um, but just really showing when that thing is on her head. And she basically put, you know, would identify, oh, here, here, and put little like Avery label stickers on her back and then had the henna artist, okay, now it's radiating out this way, counterclockwise, clockwise, whatever, start drawing that. And so this would be a, performative sort of project. I mean, this was hours to map out on her body, all this pain. And she was like, I'm in pain while you're doing this, but documenting it so that hopefully um, her plan is, you know, I'll come back every five years, do another one of these and um, see where, how it's changed, if anything. And this is someone who has attempted diet, 
uh, Botox, um, acupuncture, all sorts of meditation, everything. And it's like not working. So can you unmute yourselves? <laughs> Come on, be game. This is always the part of class that I would get really nervous about when it's like, oh no, there's stony silence. Um, but I'm gonna ask as many of you, please unmute and then go for it. What do you see? And then please, if, if you can, then what, what do you see? What does it make you think? What does it make you feel? It's like a cathedral. Like a cathedral. What specifically do you see that makes you think that? The um, vertical shape, the vertical arches that the trees make, um, the sunlight right above and pouring down with rays, uh, which is another portrayal in religious paintings. Um, it seems to be warm. There seems to be a warm interior and a cold exterior. Anybody else? Right. Yeah. I yes. We agree. We agree. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm going to change my view. Can I change my view, Stuart, or will I lose everything? Uh, what are you changing your view to? No, I just wondered if I could see who all was there. See the oh. gallery of respondents. Gallery yeah, you who can I can call right. Us. Yeah, if you click view and then gallery, side by side gallery, you can see both your presentation and the participants. Maybe, maybe not. Let's not worry about that. Somebody else. I, I agree with that, Peter Olson. What else do you see? Oh, now we see him live. I'm going to see if I can zoom in on this thing and see if that works. Yeah, that helps. It helps. Yeah, now I'm zooming in close so you can see right up my nose. Where's my mask? I'm going to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I have to check my teeth. I got to do all this. <laughs> How much easier? It's like bleeding. How do you Joe, what is this painting made from? What's the. Oh, you're a lady. Huh? A label reader, I see. Um, this part of this is to trust your observation first before you read the label. Oh, okay. So sometimes when you just go up and read the label, it's like, oh, oh, it's that, it's this. Okay. And then you just connect. You've got, gotcha. there's that answer. And so sometimes it's better to look at art on your own, just the art. Okay. And really trust and, and observe. You know, and then some of us are just snotty. Oh, we just go and go, oh, I knew it was so and so. Yeah, got it. Check. Mm. I well, had to resist the temptation to do that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else see anything about this? It's hard to look at a screen and see. Anything? Here's some little hopeful no, spring I think, things. I think this is Danae um, Spazieri. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that it seems to have all different kinds of um, seasons in it. Can you explain that, what you're seeing? That well, I'm just seeing that, cold... What specifically do you see that gives you that idea, Danae? Well, I'm seeing on the edges are cold, and then it, it as you move your eye into the center, it warms up. It's like a warming effect, especially with the sun, kind of um, the streaming of the rays. Mm -hmm. um, so it focuses your eyes into the very middle where it's warm and uh, probably a place that you'd want to go. Yeah. Nice. Anyone else want to go there? Joe? Yes. Who's that? It's Natalie or Barb. Hi, <laughs> Natalie and Barb. Yeah, because I still didn't get the view in so I could see. I gave up on it. It looks like there's a face in, there's a little face <laughs> in the uh, right side, not in that first tree, but in the second vertical. 
It's so strange. Okay, on the on the right, about maybe down low, go down again. Okay. Oh. See? Oh yeah. Mm. Uh. Looks like Archie. <laughs> There's something a little psychedelic about this to me. Yeah. Like what were they? And the birds in the back there, what seem to be birds flying, I don't right. know, or bats, something. Right. And the red. I can't figure out what all the red is interesting. What yeah, what's that red? Very, very fiery looking. Yeah. Hmm. And I can't see all the way into the back. Okay. No. That's such a shame. I have a guess about the red. Yeah. What's your um, guess? And it the uh, fiery is the key word um, because I was thinking that the color and the shape seem to relate to a fire, obviously not a um, destructive, it's more like a vision of a fire or a metaphor for a fire. And these seem to be uh, these sort of pine trees, which um, are known for um, rejuvenating through fire. So through the process of burning, they actually are reborn, which would dovetail with a religious reading of this painting. Hmm. Hey, Pete, Pete, that reminds me, looking at this, it, there's something sort of, to me, I'm just guessing, Russian about, like probably not the artist is Russian, but it is, it'd be like a firebird, I don't know. There's something vaguely, Eastern European to me. Uh, look at it. I'm, that's just oh, like uh, who is it that wrote? There's that Firebird Suite. Is that? Uh, yeah, like Stravinsky or. Yeah. But the Firebird is a Russian folk tale, isn't it? You know, about <laughs> renewal and what you were speaking about. Yeah. A lot of cultures, you know, the Phoenix. Um, yes. <laughs> regenerates or whatever. It does, the bottom seems to have some significance, but it's a little, I'm looking at this on my phone, so it's very oh. small um, to, to guess what might be going on there, if it's some sort of it like an, an uh, altar or, yeah, like things have been placed and arranged with some meanings oh. and highlighted with that warm color again. Yeah. Well, so the basic concept of doing this sort of thing is, you know, spending some time slowly observing with each other, just looking, you know, you can go later to the label, but just looking first and see what you can explore and trusting yourself, trusting your observations. And sometimes then hearing what another person is seeing and going, oh, wow, look at that. Yeah, and looking deeper. And so that's become a big part. I'm going to move us along because I see the time. <laughs> um, that's a big part of being mindful in looking at artwork. It's also, does this give us a clue of what this thing is? Um, other interpretations of this topic. And of course, this is Charles. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. There is the old bit. Watercolor. Huh. Yeah. So apparently, I think he spent most of the time, you know, from 49 to 60, he must have just kept coming back and adding a little bit, a little bit. But this is the one that's down at the Craner Art Center and showed him <laughs> Um, But this concept has become a big thing called Slow Art Day. <laughs> Um, it's been being celebrated since 2008. Um, it usually is a Saturday in April and I totally forgot because we hadn't been open on Saturdays for a while. Mm -hmm. and so I didn't even think about it. And so it's like, oh, but where there's the opportunity to do a guided walk through, look at some select pieces, not too many. Um, 
This particular thing is a handout from the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. I'm going to zoom in on this. They, you know, you're, you're, it's really hard for a painting or a sculpture to compete with technology and video and techno whiz bang or people's phones, you know, or, oh, I'm just taking a selfie. Um, it's really hard to do. And so their suggestion was, you know, selecting a piece, whether it was on your tablet or a computer or in the museum, um, you know, close your eyes, quiet yourself, breathe, then look just briefly. Don't make this painful, really briefly, 30 seconds. They have them then try to write down, look away, what do you remember? You know, what struck you to start to really decipher, you know, repeat those steps again, go back. They say even starting in a corner and scanning this thing. Because um, it's hard for some people to slow down and look. Um, we get caught up in the thing and we're going, oh, we're conceptualizing about it. We're sometimes figuring out where is this from? What was this about? The meaning sometimes, and sometimes it's like, let the meaning come from what you're seeing and gradually and in that conversation, you may have got it right away, but hopefully the work gives you a couple layers of joy to keep looking. Um, come back, they slowly go, then they have you go for three minutes, and then they have you even write down some of the things that you see, um, figuring out your interpretation of them, even what questions do you have about the artwork, making a list of those, and then slowly, slowly, then, you know, close your eyes again. So they spend as much time with their eyes closed <laughs> as open, looking at this piece, breathing and looking. Um, what happens when you look slowly? And, you know, when I was at the Marshall School in France, we'd go up to Paris to look at art and we eventually, um, I guess I should zoom out again. We eventually would get to, you know, you would just go, they would make you sit for an hour and you're going, all this other museum I want to see. I can be in Paris for a little while. And I was like, no, you just always have to go, I'm going to come back. Yeah. You know, you have to just trust that. And so to spend an hour. And so we spent a couple of days just, you know, we looked at, you know, three or four pieces a day. That was it. And it was really intense and looking. Um, course this was a piece you know obviously meant for you to be immersed in same thing you know immersion and quiet black painting but this also can be a social event and so slow art days um one of my favorite is uh when we'd go on our bus trips i won't name names if they're here on the thing shout out, but um, we would always take, um, this one couple would always split up when they got to the Art Institute and the wife would go and I gotta go see everything. I'm here, I'm in Chicago, I gotta go <laughs> look, read everything, go see it all. Husband went and sat in front of this one painting for the three hours while she walked around. Yes. And then after lunch, you know, they'd get back together and talk about their day and what they saw and what they experienced. And he did that numerous trips to Chicago. He went and sat in front of the um, Sunday afternoon in the, uh, the Grand Jatte. Um Eventually, he went and found another painting that he wanted to sit in front of. <laughs> but it's very hard to sometimes share. And so you can do it in doses, you know, go to the museum, say, let's just quickly scan through what grabs you, pulls you in, and then go to um, find the ones that, you know, I want to share my favorite with you. Let's go back and look at that. Um, some of these studies, let's see, we'll get into. Yeah. We've done some meta gallery, but this looks awfully nice. Yeah. To bring your own yoga mat. Yeah. So pain studies um, as art RX, you know, a prescription. Um, this was at the Crocker Museum in uh, Sacramento. And with people from hospitals all over involved with this study, 
you know, so people in some of the doctors involved with it are in Baltimore, Berlin, um, Zurich, as well as California, um, as well as Massachusetts, and involved in let's get this information, you know, so at least the studies go a long distance when they were doing them and doing the studies and they did docent led tours on pain. So people with chronic pain, um, sort of like that poor artist in Iowa, um, Anna Crowley Ford, but these are also people who any variation. And one of the things that's been really hard for them is the lack of socialization, the, even getting their doctors to trust them when they can't see that pain. And some of it is just so, you know, whether it's autoimmune disorder or migraines or lupus or fibromyalgia or PTSD or osteoarthritis, there's just so many things that are like just egg, you know, those studies when you go, <laughs> so they use this, um, social disconnection scale. Now I didn't end up putting that in, although they had a 12 item one and it might be worth my while to dig it out and get it in there. Because the social disconnection scale has now grown to a 60 question. Mm. <laughs> it's the UCLA um, social disconnection study. And it partly, you know, as we've gone to phones and social media and all this stuff, they've had to, you know, oh, it's more complicated. You know, where are you feeling your disconnect? So it's painful in many <laughs> So these studies, though, again, they did their, you know, demographic studies ahead of time, then they studied with this group, and then they'd come back and ask them again three weeks later, are you, were you able to, you know, lower some of that? How are you feeling? You know, do you feel better more of the time? And seeming to, partly getting dressed and going to the dang art museum, mm -hmm. being there with those other yes. people sharing with those other people who are also sitting on the little chairs with you in the gallery and going, yeah, this is okay. So they're doing this with more groups as well who maybe need to be together to go to museums and have this experience of just slow looking visual thinking studies. Just look, let that art do its thing. Let's talk about it. And then that they, yeah, I feel better. Um, Forgive me on time. Um, so of course, what caused this in the first place, I was thinking of, well, down here at the um, uh, and the Brothers of the Antonine Hospital in Isenheim in the Alsace region of France, um, dedicated to St. Anthony, you can recognize him by his Tau cross that he carries and on his little black cape, his bells and the pig. These are his symbols. Um, I don't know about the pig. So widely venerated in the Middle Ages and held as one of the, the fathers of all monks. Not the first hermit, but gets a lot of credit for huh. the idea of being a hermit because he spent so long out alone in the desert. Um, but he is the one who is um, invoked against herpes disaster or shingles, also hmm. known as St. Anthony's fire. Ah. And this, a most amazing piece, the um, altarpiece or the Isenheim altarpiece. Um, the, and I probably have way too many shots of this, but the fact that it could, you know, instead of looking at just blue and green in nature, the Antonines felt you should look at this. Mm. This will make you feel better. Yeah. <laughs> you should look at Christ's suffering to identify with Christ, you know, dying on the cross. Yes. And look at St. Anthony's suffering, low. the temptation of St. Anthony and what he went through to feel, oh, I'm not alone. And he's got pretty colors. And he has pretty colors. We'll look at that a little more. 
He also has a panel on this thing. So this is this multi-panel fabulous piece that's pretty, also pretty psychedelic um, of the ascension. So he gets to that. Around the same time, you've got, you know, Raphael making oh, lovely little crucifix, <laughs> crucifixion <laughs> scene. So much more of a um, allopathic approach, you know, of medicine versus the um, more homeopathic <laughs> kind of medicine that we get with this. And the Grunwald altarpiece is Guy Guerre was the Antonine head at the time who was like, this is what I want. Grunwald works on this thing for six years. He lives at the hospital with them. He sees the patients. This is now on view since like 2015. This is at the museum, um, the Unterlinden Museum at Colmar. And one thing that's really cool, I love this image because you can see the layers. They've taken the thing apart and have it. And we'll look at some of those images really briefly here. Um, but the idea of the crucifix, they would haul these poor patients. <laughs> this is, you know, plague, plague time. So St. Sebastian on the left, Anthony again on the right, um, as well as this people suffering with this um, St. Anthony's fire, which typically is figured out to probably be from rye poisoning as well. Um, and so one of the things that this thing causes is both spasms and gangrene. And so fingertips could be falling off. Mm -hmm. um, toes could fall off. Ooh, your feet feel like that. Yeah. <laughs> so this incredibly gruesome Christ, um, the suffering. And then here, John's hand pointing at this, draw your attention. So every day they would bring the patients down and put them in front of this altarpiece. And say, offer it up. And you sit and look at that and pray. And also knowing Christ suffered too. You know, he suffered for you. We're together in this. Because most of the people with these disease weren't going to get healed. They would get better bread. Rye bread, the rye grew easier. It grew, but it tended to, um, you, they didn't always see the moldy bits in it. And so it's that same thing, you know, where you talk about the witch, witch trials in America, even centuries later, and we should have known what was causing this. Um, but here you got John the Baptist pointing the way, um, Mary swooning, young John the Beloved holding her, Mary Magdalene identified by her long hair, and again, her fingers interwoven, but in pain that kind of thing that they could identify with. Um, one of the little monsters that is penned, but still always pestering St. Anthony. Mm. Um, so daily, both the hospital workers are looking at this thing and the patients. Mm. And, it, and then underneath we have a lamentation scene, you know, so here having taken him off the cross, truly horrific image. Um, this piece, and again, so you can see these layers, we'll zoom in on some of these other scenes in the more glorious parts you get to see are about Mary and, you know, the uh, annunciation scene in a sort of church to show it's holy and, um, the fabulous ascension rising from the dead. Um, so once in a while they would open this up on holy days and also then special days related to Mary, um, special Sundays, and you got to see, you know, the glorious thing of this. Um, on Saint, yeah, the color in this thing is spectacular. On a feast day of St. August, or yeah, St. Anthony, you got to see the 
other part of it, which has um, sculptural relief done by um, Nicholas of Hagenau. And you got to um, see, I think I have some zoom in, you got Christ and the apostles down below, St. Anthony in the middle, surrounded by, um, get my saints, Patty, St. Augustine and Jerome, you've got your donor types here. And then of course, this guy kneeling right beside um, St. Augustine is uh, Guy Guier, who was the head of the Antonine Hospital at the time when the Isenheim altarpiece was, was made. Had the vision to say, Grinwald, paint me this. So, and then another scene with another hermit, the hermit Paul on the left when St. Anthony goes to visit him. And then again, the horrific temptation. And the temptation is partly having doubts and being bored and, you know, not keeping on the holy and faithful. And so he is then pestered by someone who also looks like the patient, you know, who has these same ulcerated, horrible wounds, who has, you know, these pock marks, and they can be there. They're part of it as well. Um, other approaches, I hope you guys are okay, to looking at art and healing. This is an artist who I communicated with in getting ready for this show. I had some folks going, I don't want too many balance. And I also was like, she was in New York. She was in the middle of, I just redid my house. I can't be bothered right now, but she was great to talk with. Um, name is Pam Turkson. And she's done this series of infinite series. This one is Infinite Patience. And it was, um, it's, it, it's about a tree. It's like looking up at a fabulous tree. And she spends a lot of time with the trees. If you look at her blog, she's like, okay, she does a lot of conversations back and forth with trees. Um, but I, I kind of have that too. I'm <laughs> kind of an animist. I'm kind of a tree person. And I, I, I kind of get this, this part of like, oh, okay. Um, but she's also been the artist in residence, um, the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies. She had a horrible car accident in college and actually studied as a textile designer, beautiful stuff. But then eventually deciding, I really want to do something that helps people and helps them feel better and heal as I have to work at my own. She's also super sensitive, like hyper gets lots of, you know, vibrations from everything and colors and migraines as well. Um, so she spends some bit with her pieces with so-called sacred geometry. And I had to go with sacred geometry. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> again, statistics, I'm not taking that. <laughs> anyway, definition of these forms here, certain forms are found throughout all of life. They're all equal, they're all the same. Um, you know, certain shapes that you see and they go, that's the source of life. They got other things going, oh, this is all really good. And I'm like, okay, then I, I struggle a little bit. But you get into the, down into this idea of the Fibonacci sequence. And I'm like, okay, I have, stuff? I've seen some of that in nature. I can buy that and believe that and have some faith in that. And so the ratio of the golden mean and some perspective on stuff. I'm like, yeah, that feels better, you know, <laughs> versus something that's like, that's not quite great. So I understand that. Um, you know, Aristotle thought the golden mean really could tell about your personality as well, and behaviors. So this is serious stuff. Um, the Pam Turkson also has incorporated the mandala as a meditative process with it. And, um, you know, simple way of trying to draw this. There's many coloring books of mandalas now yeah. that you can go and do quite good. And so she's created this series on infinite inspiration. And so you can see the, some of the sacred geometry elements mm -hmm. in there. 
if you actually had this piece, you wouldn't have her name embedded at the bottom in there. Um, but these are the kind of things that you're supposed to like softly focus on the sun of study those rows and let these things, you know, allow them to, to work on you. And now, mind you, I was the kind of kid who could stare, get up early and stare at the test screen on the TV. So I, I don't know. But some of these, I was like, these are kind of cool. I could see meditating on these. Um, some of them, then she makes a series of prints. They also might have the gold or gold leaf metallic little touches. So you pay a little more to get the ones with that. And they come in different sizes. Um, and like this one is her Reiki, the infinite field. So she did get to participate in a study with these um, at the infusion center at the Sloan Kettering in Brooklyn Cancer Center. And so they had these practitioners because they also, besides giving you chemo, they're also going to give you, you know, acupuncture or Reiki and try anything and everything to help you. And so she was able to get her pieces in a study um, where the practitioners and Reiki can be done either in person or over the phone or at a distance, you know. Um, and so sometimes people were seeing the thing on the wall. Sometimes they were just seeing it on a screen. And so their comments about that, you know, some said, this was too distracting. <laughs> you know? And others were like, this is kind of cool. I like this. So it had pretty good percentages. Um, but it was, you know, a two month period. They had to use it at least so many times, whether they would continue or not. Um, and then some of the comments on it as well, and people saying, well, this is what I'm looking at and how it changes. And, you know, as I'm looking at it slowly, what I'm seeing and picking out and whether it helped or not. And so for some, it's really good. It can be very helpful and enhance this experience. Um, so you can kind of see where they are. And then, you know, for others, it's like, Beep. but she's very sincere. And so she has a very active blog. And I, 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 I believe her. <laughs> Um, another artist who I came across and we also had some conversation with for this show, we weren't sure like, how can we show your stuff? And we actually at one point thought we were going to show his movie on, um, this was pre-COVID, mind you, we planned this well-being show. And I thought we were going to get to show his fabulous fungi movie at the Egyptian theater. Um, fabulous fungi ended up not being a national day of awakening, but you can now rent it for, um, I forget, $14.95 on his website, or you can go, um, you know, there's various levels with it. But this is a guy who went to UCLA in the 70s film school. He has credits on major motion pictures because he also invented some stuff with his camera to be able to do some pretty cool types of shots. So he gets used for anything that really needs some special effects. And that's where he was, you know, a long career working on, you know, all sorts of major films. But he also created a stock film library of nature images of his films and that you can purchase to put in your film. Okay. Um, and his stuff has mostly been time lapse and high speed photography, doing 3D IMAX. Um, so they're always time and scale, things that you just can't see on your own without the camera capturing this stuff. And they really are pretty phenomenal. He's done TED Talks, he's done um, several like YouTube. Um, and his basic premise is, you know, he helps his films inspire and open people's hearts that beauty is nature's tool for survival that we protect what we love it is the shift in consciousness we need to sustain and celebrate life and so he
he has been working very hard. He, um, Oprah and Super Soul Sunday has had him on. Um, you know, he's done some of his films have been narrated. Meryl Streep has been involved, various people. And he's doing this one in particular on gratitude, um, as well as Fantastic Fungi. Um, he works with Paul Stamets, who is a um, whatever mycelium studier. There's a name for these people who study mushrooms, um, but that they see the potential of the mushrooms um, in treating cancer, PTSD, Alzheimer's, that it can clean the atmosphere when it cleans up an oil spill and the, the fungi will grow. And then all of a sudden you have other things being able to grow there. And that he got involved with this because it could save the bees and he knew that was a problem. So he's been working on these things in different ways. His work has also been do doing in some studies. And if you're okay, I have a link here. It's not the most high production of his films. They usually are really slick, but I think this is done during COVID and it's done, um, I think if I'm supposed to go click, click to do it, we'll see what happens. Um, it looks like the family filmed this one. I'm like, why is he so, why is he so like blurry? Great to be here with you. My name is Lee Corsair. For over four decades, I've been using famous photography to explore Understand. Joe, we can only hear the, the narration. We can't see the screen. You'll have to share the video, the browser. Oh, wait, wait. I thought I was. We're still seeing your PowerPoint. I know. Really? Sorry, you're going to hear him. How do I get to it? You can click share again and then click the browser tab the, when it gives you the options of what to share. I lose everything. Share again. Sorry, guys. I tried to I tried to make his screen bigger. I don't know if I do it. Share screen. So I began to think about how my oh there he is. Do you see that? Yes. Joe, we can't hear him. Oh, no. Oh. All right. Well, do you hear that? Can you hear that? It's a little better. It's a little louder now. Uh, if you want, I would share the URL in the chat, and individuals can copy and paste it into their own browser at the end of the presentation. Okay. I've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. My diagnosis was so bad that uh, my prostate, it was, you know, they weren't giving me any, any chance whatsoever. Once a volunteer is enrolled in the study, they're with us for the preparation, the psilocybin sessions, and the integration follow-ups after. It's really just about experiencing what comes up as psilocybin takes effect. And the intense part of this journey, this world and things that matter to most people, family and all that, that wasn't even what it was about. It's anything mystical can't be explained. It's something like that. It's 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 a feeling of such immense power that you can't even imagine. I think it's something you like before. It was
is about being in a place of infinite space and just being there. There's a experience of positive mood, sometimes open heartedness, love, uh, transcendence of time and space. And then finally, it's thought to be ineffable. People say, I can't describe that experience. One third of individuals in the study said it's the single most spiritually significant experience of their lives. About 70% say it's the among the five most personal meaningful experiences of their lives. And you say, well, so what, what what does that mean? You know? And and initially I thought, I wonder if they don't have pretty dull lives. Um, but you no, know, people would say, you know, when my firstborn came into this world, I'll, I'll never forget that. And life has never been the same since. Or my father passed away. That was deeply moving to me. I'm different now in the world. So, you know, it's kind of like that. The most glorious part of it was that it made me feel more comfortable with, with living, you know, because uh, you're not afraid. Sir, I'm going to try to. Um... Making the invisible visible has been a lifelong passion for me. And I've seen how nature's imagery can help people heal. Later this year, we're going to do a clinical trial at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute using psilocybin or my nature imagery to treat patients with alcohol disorders. Um, just because of our time. Okay, so now do you see? We see your power. Yeah, we see your PowerPoint now. So, um, if I can get that in. just for time, I will put that link in there so you can watch it because it sounds like it's really difficult to see that. And I'm suddenly about to edit my thing and I don't want to do that on the current slide. So I'm just going to say to wrap up, if not taking some time to slowly look at art and to enjoy that experience in the museum as well that we've been doing all along and now they're doing it in hospitals too and just realizing how really valuable all of that is my other recommendation for healing and well-being is to get a dog and like a slow art day in the gallery or museum they force you to go for walks at all times of day all kinds of weather allowing you to see the subtle changes in nature especially as winter thaws and spring begins to bud and as trees for the longest time look to appear dead slowly come to life as late bloomers this is our new dog buddy that kind of <laughs> so i will put that link to um what's his name's uh, schwartzberg's thing and if anyone wants, because it's, yeah, he goes on a little bit long and that's probably too hard and plus we're late. So I'm done. If anyone else wants to chat, please do. Or questions or anything. I'll have to see if I can grab that thing. I'm not too savvy here. Stuart, talk to people. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, Joe finds the URL link uh, and puts that in the chat. Thank you all uh, for joining us this afternoon. And are you are you waving at me? Did you need my attention? Can't hear Stuart. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, be sure to check out our events calendar and uh, the virtual events uh, upcoming. We have one more in this program series. Um, or you can view a selection of our recorded past events just like this one. No. Uh,
if you're watching locally, this exhibition runs through Saturday. You're welcome to visit our website at niu.edu forward slash art museum to schedule a free timed masked and physically distanced admission. Portions of the exhibition very well, thank you. The arts as a means to well-being is viewable in our virtual format online at niu.edu forward slash art museum forward slash exhibitions. Uh, if you aren't able to join us in the galleries in person. Again, all the URLs uh, that I've mentioned are in the event chat. Um, did you need, are you able to, to put your link in the chat? I put the link in. I see it. Okay. If you hear me, you also hear the music in the background from the movie I stopped. <laughs> it's very groovy right now. <laughs> so. Great. So that URL of the YouTube video that uh, Joe screened in the presentation is available in the chat now as well. Are there any questions for Joe about her presentation? All right. Well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Joe, any last comments? Stay well. Stay well. Do good. Love you all. Feeling better already. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>